Hi, Adam. I know we've done this before and I'm working under you right now, but still, can you like introduce yourself for the audience? Sure. Yeah, my name is Adam Petway. Uh, I'm currently uh, the director of performance for men's basketball at the University of Louisville. I'm also an adjunct professor in the athlete engineering department at Mississippi State. Um, primarily, I've worked in basketball. I've worked at every level, high school, division three. Power Five, mid-major, National Basketball Association, now back in uh, college. But I've dabbled in the speed power world as well, working with uh, some pretty elite level sprinters and uh, jumpers. And, um, you know, I, I feel like that's why there's such great synergy between you and I, uh, just uh, in a lot of ways, uh, just viewing things from a different lens, using a lot of the concepts of our mentors like uh, Boo Schneck Snyder and uh, speed power principles and apply them to a, a team sport environment. Nice, nice. So uh, this is going to be like a question out of the blue, but like what there's like multiple like uh, jobs, like sports scientists, there's mm -hmm. like there's like jobs like strength and conditioning coaches or performance coaches right now. So can you tell us like what, it's, what's the difference between sports scientists and like um, a performance coach or sports strength and conditioning coach? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Eric. I think, uh, you know, a lot of the best sport performance coaches and strength and conditioning coaches, in my opinion, use the scientific process to objectively help their athletes. Right. So in, in a lot of ways, there's a lot of synergy and a lot of uh, carryover. Right. Um, however, you know, as a strength and conditioning professional or performance coach, your primary objective is to get them stronger and well conditioned or increase performance directly on the court, our field or pitch or track or wherever that may be, may lie, uh, depending on what sport you work with. I think the, the practitioner of the sports scientist is uh, more uh, take a 10,000 foot view of things and maybe see how you can use objective metrics to help and create synergy not only in performance but also medical technical tactical and uh, just kind of create a conduit of uh, synergy between multiple departments right so a little bit different from that that regard but I do think the best performance coaches use the scientific process right and the best sports scientists have an idea of what uh, performance looks like and how to increase performance you know maybe they're not doing uh you know creating mesocycles for the athletes or you know uh you know looking at a granular situation as far as sets and reps but they definitely understand you know stress and adaptation right you know functional overreaching super compensation these physiological principles that are based in science um a good sports scientist should have a foundation in that even though maybe they're not writing the weight room programs nice nice the reason why I start with this one is because, like, there's a sports scientist who really want to know a lot, who really want to learn a lot from you. So I he texted me, so I, <laughs> I think, like, I should probably start with this one. So I'm going to, like, like, start with the daily test or, like, we do it probably, like, twice or three times a week, like, the force play testing. Mm -hmm. And I know we do a counter movement jump, a counter movement rebound jump, and a five hop test. So why exactly do you like uh choose these tests for our athlete to do it? Yeah, I think I I, I think when you look at neuromuscular profiling, I think it's a uh, spectral meaning like there's different uh different tests will uh kind of look at different things, right? So you, we, we talked a lot with Coach Boo when he was on campus about stages of neuromuscular fatigue. So what we want to do with this gamut of tests is to look at uh, and kind of traverse the bell curve of where fatigue is occurring within our athletes, right? So the counter movement jump, the bread and butter, probably the most uh, studied force plate assessment there is, um, maybe that in the isometric mid-thigh pull, but the, the counter movement Jump the gold standard, hands on hips, standardized, repeatable way to assess neuromuscular function, right? Um, so there's a lot of really good information you can get there, right? So it, to, to me, it, it's an absolute metric, right? So you look at relative peak power, peak power relative to body mass. Um, you could look at right versus left. You could look at asymmetry and braking versus propulsive. Um, so a lot of really good information you can get there. But if that's all you're looking at, right, as we know, 
you know, uh, relative power qualities are usually on the late stages of neuromuscular fatigue, right? So if you're already looking at your counter movement jump, like just peak outputs, you're probably a little too late of maybe getting a little more forward thinking as it relates to intervening on a potential onset of neuromuscular fatigue, right? So then we go to our second one, right? <clears throat> the rebound jump. So um, obviously the second stage of, you know, Coach Boo's neuromuscular fatigue is um, elasticity, right? Like uh, just uh, reactive strength qualities. So you get a lot of that with um, with the counter movement rebound jump, right? So it's a, just a jump, right? And then you land, you spend minimal ground contact time and you jump as high as fast as possible on the second jump, right? So uh, again, assessing those like, you know, reactive strength qualities or elasticity within the tissue is a good way to maybe uh, catch the onset of neuromuscular fatigue a little bit earlier than some of your absolute metrics, right? So a temporal metrics or a time dependent metric like reactive strength, really, really good at just kind of teasing that out. Um, and then the high frequency hop or the POGO, the five jump assessment, right? So just looking at uh, getting off the plate as quickly as possible, making it reactive. The first stage is refined uh, motor skills. So in, in a sport or a sporting activity like uh, horizontal jumps, where are you at on the board, right? So let's say you're doing your shoulder approach work and you're always on the board and maybe you're a little bit behind or a little bit in front. Maybe that's the first stage or onset of uh, neuromuscular fatigue and the fact like, hey, they're usually super coordinated. They're usually uh, very aware of where their limbs are at in space, but they're, you know, a little bit off today. I'm not sure what that is. That's usually the first stage or onset of neuromuscular fatigue. You know, uh, with, with the five hop test, you could look at, uh, you know, across hops, just flight to contact time. Um, it, it is really just a, a basic metric that, that you can look at, but what are they doing within the five hops? If you see a decrement within the five, oh man, that doesn't look good. If they're really inconsistent within the five, man, that doesn't look good. So, you know, my best movers and my best athletes are always going to, you know, have a par parabolic force time curve in, in that movement. And they're pretty much all going to look the same, right? If it's off, they're going to look different. It might undulate. It might go down. It might go up, but they're inconsistent, right? So refine motor skill, the first of uh, the stages of neuromuscular fatigue. So to me, when I look at multiple jump tests for force platform analysis, you can tease out potential uh, sets of, uh, you know, neuro neuromuscular profiling, but also neuromuscular fatigue, right? So, um, and then all, all three of those are a good metric of fatigue, but also performance as well. You know, if, if you're jumping higher, that's always a, a great tactical advantage in most, uh, most sports, I know, if you can displace your center of mass vertically higher than your opponent, you know, if you can do that at a quicker rate, that's also a good thing. So there's also a, a performance component to it as well. So it really just depends on what questions you're trying to answer. For me, in the evolution of my analysis as it relates to force platforms, I've always, I, I've always thought those three, if you can do those with a high rate of frequency and have depth within your assessment, I think that will tell you a lot about where your athletes are at. Nice, nice, nice. So, uh, for the rebound testing, the counter movement rebound testing, uh, we did it with basketball. We did it with, uh, pole vault. We did it with jumpers. And today, mm -hmm. I, I kind of like discuss it with one of our one of one of our jumpers that his counter movement jump wasn't that high. But he's like re re like RSI is like crazy high, like four point two. Yeah, but, oh man, that's yeah one of the one of the best we've seen. Ever. Yeah, but but if you compare it to his like teammates, there's like other jumps are like the counter movement jump is higher, and mm -hmm. is it harder for like those like counter movement jump jump higher and the uh next rebound? Is it hard for them to like absorb and then rebound? Yeah, on the second jump. Yeah, performance guy, that's a really good insight. Just really, really good. I, I think and that that's why having Jake in there, uh, the the jumper you're referring to, his insight in our weight room has been awesome. So I'm I'm glad that uh you know we had the opportunity for you to bring him in. But but uh no, you, that's a very poignant uh uh comment and it's a very astute observation because 
it, you know, reactive strength is just a byproduct or a ratio of uh, jump height to contact time. And anytime you're dealing with ratios, you have to provide context of why that ratio may be high or maybe low, right? So in, in this particular jumper's case, his jump height isn't good, but as his, um, you know, rebounding effect on the second jump, he can maintain or in increase jump height with decreasing contact time, right? Relative to his peers. So I, I think I think that's a good point. And, and yeah, so when, when I would profile an athlete and I'd look at that, I, I would say, well, short ground contact plows, he's probably great. He's probably really good at certain phases of acceleration, but maybe absolute strength qualities need to improve and maybe some starting strength qualities need to improve, right? So it, again, that that is an assessment. But if you just looked at the ratio and said, man, four is great, uh, you know, you'd be like, oh, this kid doesn't need anything. So I, I think when you're dealing in ratios, right, and that's definitely what reactive strength index is, it's good to understand why things are high, right? Uh, does he just have an extremely crazy jump? And contact time is average, or in his case, jump height is average, but contact time is crazy. So he's quick. So uh, another thing too, he's probably really qu quick off the board. I would assume. I don't know. I've never actually seen him jump, but you you've seen a lot of his short approach work. So it's like he probably doesn't rely on a lot of horizontal impulse on the board or setting up his penultimate. He probably just runs through, cycles through, and just lets that you know momentum from you know his drive phase and acceleration just kind of carry him. Sure. Sure. Um, where it's a lot of those more strength dominant athletes that you'll see in my, my uh, experience with jumps and Bob and Jeff and all the other guys that you've had on here would be much better resources for this, but your higher levels of athlete, absolute strength guys will not only have a better, probably start on the back half of their approach, but they're also probably going to spend a little more ground contact time setting up their penultimate and a little bit more time on the board to create horizontal impulse and project their center of mass in a parabolic flight path. So, yeah, I, I, I think it's all relative. It's all relative. Nice. Nice. So, uh, like I mentioned, we work with a lot of athletes and we get to like test like pole vault jumpers, all those like crazy talented athletes. And yes. I know you, you have like, a how do I say this? You have a, testing protocol force mm -hmm. weight testing and you also do uh force velocity profiling and we also use uh mid typo mm -hmm. so uh can you explain like why do we use like mid typo and i know we're working on a project on dsi so your thoughts on like dsi yeah dynamic strength index i think uh again it's a ratio so it, is it <laughs> it's all contextual um, no, I think the isometric mid thigh pole is a good standardized repeatable way and it's easy to assess uh, just um, absolute strength qualities, right? So uh, gold standard, again, counter movement jump is to jumping as the mid thigh pole is into a uh, strength diagnostic, right? It's uh, been studied, been validated, um, and it's a standardized repeatable way to assess um, absolute strength qualities. So I, I think, uh, you know, using that is, is really good, but, you know, uh, our friend Giorgio Zucca is, you know, starting his PhD journey and wants to look at dynamic strength index and the, the ratio of belt squat to uh, thigh pull in relationship to counter movement jump and rebound jump. And not only we know peak force is going to be higher um, in belt squat and peak force is going to be higher um, in counter movement rebound jump but is it proportionally higher to your traditional dynamic strength index and again dealing with the ratio of peak force and a counter movement jump relative to your peak force and a mid thigh pull so uh, again really interesting project but why do we use it uh it, it's just to and i think you're uh you the pole vaulters we work with in remote coaches with yeah so um i like to use it as just like a monthly check-in just to see like are the adaptations that we're trying to, you know, accrue during training sticking, right? So it's like, you know, we we really, at, we're coming right out of a max effort uh, block, right? So, you know, we would assume mid thigh pole would go up in peak force, which it has. So that's good. As we kind of transition into more of our light Olympic lifting and more of our ballistic, um, like reactive strength type qualities in our mesocycles, we would want you know, not only our rebound jump to go up, but a lot of those lighter accelerations, right? So those 20 meter excels we were doing with the timing gates, 
the loaded ones, the incremental loaded ones went up significantly. The ones that were body weight did not go up as much. We would actually want to see the opposite uh, going into our next phase as we transition uh, into the new year, particularly as we kind of transition to that indoor to outdoor type uh, type seasons. Nice, nice. So um, for like, I know like some people would use DSI to see um, like we mentioned, if, if they need to like work on like more strength side of or work on more like elasticity mm. and like i think a few months ago i have a discussion with another coach it's not about dsi it's about like uh the, nowadays there's like football you can see it in football you can see it like jumpers we mentioned yeah. or sprinters there's, there's like uh a faster based athlete and there's like strength based as sure. athlete. Yeah. So I was thinking at that time I was thinking that mm, let's say like like jumper maybe he's faster based athlete. He's just super elastic mm -hmm. elastic. If we train like too much max strength, is it gonna take away his talent? It will it take away his talent? I, I wouldn't say <laughs> it would necessarily take away his talent but you're absolutely right and this is a great point um uh, that that we always talk about is uh when dealing in deficits force velocity profile like dynamic strength index things like that you're going to be in a strength deficit you're going to be in a force deficit you're going to be in a velocity deficit um well they may be in a deficit and if all you do is focus on where they're poor it may detract from what makes them really good at their sport, right? So I do think there needs to be a balance, right? You're never going to turn, like you said, a really fashionably driven, you know, um, triple jumper into like a, you know, offensive lineman, right? <laughs> so I, I think I think context is everything, particularly when you're dealing with profiling and particularly when you're dealing with ratios. Why is a ratio high or low relative to their peers? Why do they have a deficit on one side of the curve and, and that'll provide a little more context to uh, training interventions. Right. But I do think, you know, and going back to our good friend, Boo, he's always uh, told, you know, potentiate their strengths in season, potentiate their weaknesses in the off season. Right. So if I really want to work on deficits, make sure it's like as far away from competition as possible or the most important competitions in the off season. And in, in season, you want to facilitate their strengths, right? Because I know, you know, I mean, we phase out a lot of static lifts during the competitive season because for a lot of different reasons, uh, you know, proprioceptive inhibition, a blunt elasticity, you know, which are things that are pretty important in basketball. But some of our more strength dominant athletes want to come in and bench, squat and deadlift on you know their high neuromuscular day so you just kind of let that ride but if i was to do that with a very fashionably driven athlete i may be um uh, hurting them and not helping them particularly in the competitive season you're absolutely right on it i like i like i like this because like i think nowadays there's like uh more and more sport text more and more paper and a lot of like research going out but the time when coach Wu was here and we have a discussion me and you have a discussion that why i learned from coach Wu the most is context is everything like you mentioned yeah. so i enjoy like working under you or working with you is the part that a lot of times like we need to do the test but you see the athlete maybe they're like maybe they have interview today Maybe they have like tests going on school. Maybe they have school like tests, Definitely. whatever it is, and you were willing to cut it. At like in my opinion, that's like great coaching. Like the greatest coach know when to cut it. I like that. Yeah, man. Context is everything, and you know these young people go through a lot in, in their lives. So I think you know knowing the athletes and kind of meeting them where they're at. You know, we do test. We test our guys a lot more than most schools. And uh, I'm very respectful of the fact of uh, these young people's time and effort for that. Nice, nice. So uh, I'm going to jump out of force plate. And this, is, the next part is about like, I want to talk about like GPS. I know uh, different school use different system. I know MB some NBA team use uh, Connexon. I know some 
maybe England rugby team you use capo, but whatever it is, this is for those like I can't say who it is, but there's a lot of like sports <laughs> scientists text me said they want to know this, so I have to ask this. So, um, in your experience, I know you work with uh Sixers, you you work with Wizards, am I right? Correct, yes. Yeah, and you also work with tons of like college basketball. You also work with like we mentioned different kind of sports. So in your experience, like uh for basketball her, mm -hmm. what kind of like metrics should we look into? I know it's definitely different from football. Yeah, so, sure. Yeah. Sure. So what kind of metrics would you look into? The first thing it, I, I would say on that is understand, again, context of the competitions versus the training, right? So what does a basketball athlete do? And, you know, going back to one of uh, my first, you know, systematic reviews uh, for, for my PhD, that first paper was just looking at training load and match play demands in basketball based on competition level. So what do we know about basketball? Well, it's played 94 by 50 foot perimeter, right? Um, you know, in, in our game, we're, it's kind of weird in college basketball. We have two 20 minute halves, right? In the NBA, you have four 12 minute quarters, right? So it's a little bit longer in duration in the NBA, but it's usually going to be around 40 to 50 minutes. So, you know, just depending on where you play in the world, right? Um, where most, uh, most of the basketball playing world is in four quarters. How much distance are you going to cover? Well, you know, typically in a high level, you know, college basketball game or NBA anywhere between 1.8 and 2.2 miles total distance, right? Uh, what speeds are you covering? Well, there's huge degrees of variance based on position and just based on, um, you know, output or, or what you're capable of as far as max speed. But we do know as far as high threshold accelerations, you're usually going to hit anywhere between about 15 and 25 bandwidth accelerations over 3.5 meters per second squared, right? So you're going to accelerate at a fast rate 15 to 25 times, right? So I would take that context. You have volume, you have total distance covered, you have intensity as far as high threshold accelerations. And I would start building your training around game demands, right? What, what does a game look like relative to your training? Um, I, I think certain coaches gravitate towards more just distance and speed. Um, you know, uh, currently we're operating in arbitrary units. So it's like, hey, today, a game's 500 and our practice was a 1300. So we did a lot, right? But still it provides context to the coaches of like, where is your training at in relationship to a game, right? There's volume, how much you do, there's intensity um, and densities as far as like the rate at which you do work. Um, is it above a game? Is it comparable to a game or is it below a game? And then you got to start filling gaps, right? Like if you're, if you're, you know, doing double the volume and half the intensity, that's going to be a problem, right? If you're doing half the volume and not able to cover certain distances in your, you know, training, that's going to also be an issue. So I think, I think it's, it's to, to make something complex seem really simple, just look at volume and intensity of training and kind of, or excuse me, look at volume and intensity of competition and kind of reverse engineer your training to reflect that. And then, you know, your match day minus one, 24 hours prior, match day minus two, 48 hours prior, you just kind of want to fill gaps. And, you know, what we found in our studies, right, is two days out, a little bit higher volume, maybe the uh, intensity is moderate. One day out or match day minus one, you really want to be brief in nature. So a lot lower volume than a game, but you want to be at game intensity. So there's, uh, I guess, a potentiation effect. And that's just not my opinion. That's based on you know, our work that we did with uh, Jesse and Todd and Tim Gavin and those guys with uh, five years of data from one school relative to the closing point spread differential or how you fared against the uh, you know, betting sp spread. And now that we're looking at multiple schools using the same methodologies, we're finding something very simple, similar, where it's not necessarily the volume that's going to dictate uh, match day performance in training. It's going to actually the intensity. If the intensities are high, you're typically going to play well. Um, so, so to me, uh, you know, the whole, you know, whatever you use, LPS, GPS, accelerometry, if you're indoor, if you're outdoor, just look at a game. What are you doing? How does training compare to what you have going on in a game? 
And it, as long as you program it in to where it's optimal for, you know, uh, competition, then you're doing your job. Now, frequency of competitions, you play twice a week, you play once a week, you know, when are your most important competitions? Um, there's going to be variance in there, sport to sport, team to team, just depending on what you're trying to accomplish. There's nuances uh, between the technical and tactical staff and how you kind of fill those buckets. But you do want to fill those buckets for sure. Nice. I want to dive a little bit deeper into this because uh, I had a conversation with a pro team sports scientist and he said like, this is from him, not me. I don't know. But uh, he said that nowadays he thinks strength and conditioning, everybody kind of do the same. So what dictates winning or losing are exactly are probably going to go to uh, how their sport scientists go through this da these data. How are they going to deal with these data? So yeah. what are your thoughts on like, uh, <laughs> yeah, this, I don't know. Well, I think, I think that's a, a very uh, bold statement from the prism of a sports scientist, right? Because what's going to dictate success in competition is not the training or the weight training and not the spreadsheets. It's the athletes making the play. So the team with the better athletes is typically going to, you know, win in whatever sport, you know, you're doing. Now your preparation, you know, physically, technically, tactically is going to have, you know, uh, an immense impact on match day performance. But yeah, to just say, oh, no, it's the sports science or, hey, it's the weight room or, hey, no, we have the best conditioning program there is, is um, kind of a fallacy, in my opinion, in the fact like the players are going to make the plays and the one that are actually going to win the games. Um, having good tactics helps, technical skill development helps, physical preparation helps. Um, but at the end of the day, the players are going to make the plays. Now, knowing your your players and the best coaches, in my opinion, maximize the talent that they do have. I think that's that that's really what it comes down to. But but to to say it's like, oh, it's the data or oh, it's the weight room or oh, it's like this one thing. No, if it's the one thing, it's uh, be really good at talent acquisition acquiring the best talent is usually going to win the games. Nice. I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm glad that I work with Bob and I work with you and both of you are like athletes. And is it athlete center? Like you put our athlete, how they feel, how, well, how they feel today. The, the most important thing. I, yeah. I love that. Yeah, no, Bob does a great job. And I'm actually very thankful for, uh, you know, having the opportunity to be around him. Not a, a, around him as much as I'd like, uh, but man, he really does a great job with his athletes. And, and a lot different uh, mindset and sport, but yeah, he does an unbelievable job. So I'm very thankful. You know, he's been a great addition to the university for sure. Cool. So uh, I know you work with track athletes. I know you work with jumpers. I know you work with Olympians. Man, crazy fast sprinters. So how exactly do like do you think that all those experience like um working with college basketball and then go to like pro setting and then be a track coach and then go back to like uh be a basketball strength coach, how does that experience like help you grow as a coach? Yeah, honestly, you know, I think having a, a diverse network of people you can rely on and working with a lot of different athletes is really important. Uh, you know, my my time in track, I, I was fortunate enough, um, you know, uh, 2013, um, Wallace Spearman just happened to walk in the weight room at, at University of Arkansas. And, um, you know, we, we cultivated a really good partnership and a really good friendship to this day. So, He's the one that kind of exposed me to a lot of, um, you know, elite level track and field coaches and uh, athletes. And I'm very, very thankful for that. Um, and that definitely shaped my uh, my view on uh, performance. Right. So, it, you know, up to that point, I only knew basketball and maybe a couple other sports. But, you know, working with uh, really good, you know, 200 meter and 100 meter sprinters was uh, kind of eye opening in a lot of ways. And I'm very uh, appreciative of that opportunity. Nice. So 
do you think that there's a lot like difference between sprinting, jumping, and basketball? And like, if I'm going to ask you to describe what's, I know it's a lot different, but can you like narrow it down? What's the difference? Yeah, I, I would say, uh, obviously, the repeat bouts of acceleration and deceleration and jumping are going to be different, right? Because, like, uh, you know, long jump, you approach, you know, you have, you know, the uh, prelims, you jump three times, finals, you jump three times. So six jumps total. Um, you know, it, let's say you run the 100, 200 in a relay, you're running three times. Uh, but it's maximal outputs, right? So it's not repeat bouts of effort. And you have to be on point. If those guys are 98%, they're not getting on the podium, right? Our guys are never 98% in basketball. <laughs> they're always suboptimal. So it's just repeat bouts of effort that they have to jump, accelerate, decelerate, change direction, cut, maneuver, player-to-player -player contact. So all, all of those game demands and match demands are sub-maximal, but they're very uh, repeated in nature. Um, outside of that, you know, uh, another good friend of ours, uh, you know, Todd Wright that works out in L.A., he always says dominate your space. So the ability to create space on offense and occupy space on defense is uh, a separating factor in the great players that he's been around over the years. And I, I would definitely agree with that. Um it, you know, and what what does that look like? To, to me, it's how you sequence your joints in time and space, right? Is it segmental or is it congruent? You know, are, do you have the ability to accelerate, decelerate in an efficient manner to, uh, you know, uh, sequence, sequence your joint actions to create space for a good uncontested shot on offense? Or, you know, depending on the schematics of the defense and how you guard ball screens and dribble handoffs and what kind of defense you play, you know, can you you know, contort your limbs in a certain way to contest a shot, hopefully a long contested two from a uh, low percentage shooter in basketball. So th those things are very important. But yeah, I think, um, you know, for a track athlete, you, you have to be pretty much optimal going into competition or you're not going to perform well. Our guys are always suboptimal <laughs> as soon as you start preseason. And I, I think that's pretty much standard around uh particularly in the NBA, you got to bring it 82 times if you're healthy. And then, you know, most college basketball teams probably train too much, in, in my opinion. <laughs> I, I don't think any college basketball teams probably lose games because they're out of shape. I think a lot of college basketball teams probably lose because they're doing a little too much at certain times of the year. So uh, you're, you're probably going to be suboptimal from a performance standpoint and, and going into most competitions in basketball. So that that is a stark difference. Cool. So that that kind of leads me to the next question. Like you mentioned, create space or like try to like uh, if your ball handler try to create space and your defender try to catch up. That leads me to like I know we as a as a strength and conditioning coach or as a performance coach, we need to watch our athlete move on the basketball court. That's kind of like. I think that's kind of like the main takeaway when we do the first podcast. I really like that one. So, uh, and all those time we spent together at the court watching athlete move for horizontal movement. I'm kind of sick of like linear sagittal movement. I sprint every day, so whatever. Um. Uh, <laughs> For horizontal move, it's hard. no lateral movement. Sorry, lateral movement. For lateral movement, like shuffle, crossover, mm. uh, what would you look at? Like, is it, is it, is it, or how wide should an athlete stand? Is it shorter width or is it hip width? Uh, you know, it, uh, when you break down the context of the game, and that's a great question because frontal plane movement and lateral movement are so important in the game of basketball. You know, I think you can look at three things. Um, well, first of all, there's a tactical component, right? So in college basketball, high middle ball screens, you're typically going to hedge hard, right? And if it's a good shooter, you're going to go over the ball screen, right? To stay connected, to contest a shot. If it's a bad shooter, you're going to go under, right? Um, you could switch the ball screens if you have really athletic bigs. Not, not as common, 
in, in college basketball. In the NBA on side ball screens, right, you're going to down or ice it, right, or essentially uh, force the primary ball handler to the sideline away from the screen. So how you're guarding ball screens is going to uh, really dictate a lot of the frontal plane movement and the stance you want to be in. From there, you can look at three things that are going to dictate outputs in the frontal plane, right? Your first being just magnitude of force, magnitude or peak lateral force. The more force you can put through the ground, action, reaction, Newton's third law, the quicker you're going to translate in the opposite direction. The second one, from a kinematic standpoint, hip abduction velocity. So from the, from the lead leg, how quickly can your hip abduct to kind of prevent the primary ball handler from dribble penetration? That's two. The third one is more anthropometric. It's uh, just, you know, the femoral length in swing phase, uh, the longer the femur, the greater the moment arm. And the more it's probably going to affect, you know, those kinematic factors such as, uh, you know, hip abduction velocity or even kinetic factors, probably not as much on uh, lateral uh, magnitude of lateral ground reaction force. But those are the three things from our studies that we found, right? So um, as well as tactically, you know, how you're guarding ball screens. Like if I'm Rudy Gobert and I have a lot of length, I can be in what's called a drop coverage, right? Where I'm just kind of sinking and I can use my length and that's how we're going to play. But if I'm like, uh, you know, Wendell Carter Jr., and I'm in a situation, I have to kind of be up to touch, like we we call it, and really be high on that middle ball screen to prevent dribble penetration. So I'm very, I'm showing hard. And uh, as my my friend Ryan Richmond would say, who is our co-author, explode out to reroute. So you're exploding out of that ball screen situation in the frontal plane to reroute the primary ball handler and then recover. Um, so, so all of these things are at play when we're talking about frontal plane movement. Um, but, but to me, it's again, context and profiling, right? Are you more of a kinematic mover where you can really abduct your hip at a high rate of velocity, or are you just a big, strong kid that puts a lot of force into the ground? And, and that will kind of dictate, um, what we do. I mean, you've, you know, not been here for our off season, like lateral, speed development, but we'll do a lot of lateral sled pushes and work, um, you know, working on frontal plane. But a lot of that will be dictated, uh, again, by what kind of movers they are. And looking at what they get on the court, right? So that those kind of short, shallow amplitudes of low magnitudes of lateral force at <laughs> sub-maximal intensities, they get those in spades. Boom, boom, every day, boom. 100 reps, boom, like you you know. Uh, so for me to do that and mimic that in the weight room, I'm either want to get like maybe some frontal plane locomotion patterns, like our skipping variations, just to get a little rhythm to it, right? Um, a little cadence, maybe kind of reset the neuromuscular system. Or what I'm going to want to do is just like load the shit out of or load a very heavy sled in the lateral plane or a very, uh, you know, belt loaded, like a uh, plate stack and just do like a frontal plane lateral leaping. Right. So I, I think, um, to do a lot of like low amplitude, sub maximal, like frontal plane movement, agility type stuff. I mean, they get a lot of that on the court and these kids play 13 months out of the year. So I, I think, uh, I think that's probably not the best way to do it. So you either pick high intensity, right. Or just rhythm and cadence. But don't just do a lot of stuff that's just, uh, you know, just wasted movement. Like it, like it. So uh, you also mentioned that contacts matter. So in different plays or like maybe different players, they're going to have different stand with different decision making. Mm -hmm. So probably the smartest, the smartest player going to have different, like move differently in different situations. So yeah. uh do you think that like these type of like basketball IQ or game IQ is trainable? Mm. That's a great question. I do think through repetition you can train efficiency. So you can't 
if you can't make a kid with a low basketball IQ, maybe a high basketball IQ, but you can move the needle a little bit to make them more efficient. And I think that's what it comes down to in, in a lot of regards is movement efficiency. So when we're, when we're doing, you know, a, a lot of these drills, which you'll find, and you know, this from our conversations is that the best players actually cover the least amount of distance, right? Because they're efficient, but they do so at the, the highest velocities. So they have the bandwidth to, um, you know, accelerate and decelerate at a high rate. But they just don't have to do it as frequently because they're in good positions, right? So I think I think through repetition you can train movement efficiency. I do think, but to to say you can make an extremely low IQ basketball player a uh, really high one, yeah, that's going to take some time. But you can move the needle for sure. Cool. The next one is like we talk a lot about uh, sports scientists. We talk a lot about like. Uh performance weight training whatever it is one thing i noticed about you like that i think that makes you special is like you understand the game you probably understand the game better than like large head coaches do you think that understand the sport is important thing for like performance coaches or or is it like just athletes athlete just test them and I think whatever it shows. I think when adding value within an environment, it's under it, it's it's so important to understand the culture and the context at which you're you're dealing with a hundred percent. But I, I will say, when it comes to just training an athlete to make them, you know, uh, you know, more robust, more resilient, you know, better at their sport, it, it, general physical preparation it is you know, going to look very similar regardless of, uh, you know, competition demands. So uh, I think in both, right? I think you have just to have a good basic knowledge of general physiology um, and biomechanics just from a human standpoint. But I also think understanding the technical aspect and tactical aspect of the sport you're dealing with is also just so important. So I think it's a combination of the both. From a general standpoint, you got to understand just human physiology and biomechanics from a specific standpoint you have to understand the technical and tactical aspects and uh, sporting demands of the athletes you're you're dealing with just to provide context i think i think that's more of like a value add from a cultural standpoint than anything not to say like you know i mean we're not hooking bungee cords up and doing crazy like ball handling drills or anything like that but you know we do do a lot of things that mimic movement patterns that occur on the court so I think it's a combination of the both, right? Cool. So uh I wanna ask another question about it. Probably it's correlated to lateral movement. I keep saying this wrong. It's correlated with lateral movement. Mm -hmm. So in order to have like good change of direction, we need to at least reach research that you need to have like good deceleration. So mm -hmm in order to like change deceleration, how would you like introduce it, introduce deceleration and start from the off season and go through in season? How would you like put it, microdose it, whatever? Yeah, yeah no, I, I think uh, there's working at the task directly, right? But I also think, uh, again, from a general physical preparation standpoint, if you can accelerate really efficiency and have good dry fees and mechanics and project your center of mass horizontally, I think that'll translate. I think if your jumps and plyos are good and you're doing short ground contact hurdle jumps and can project your center of mass vertically in a very congruent manner, I think that that also helps. Right. So uh, I think the rate at which you can do that, the rate at which you can, uh, you know, uh, decelerate a barbell or a hex bar, um, all of these things from a general standpoint are going to carry over as it relates to specific cutting and change of direction. And you get to think, too. From a submaximal low intensity short amplitude, these guys 13 months out of the year, Eric, are getting that cutting change of direct. Like, so for, for us to mimic that by just compounding like low intensity, low amplitude, like cutting change of direction tasks is uh 
kind of a, a null effect in, in my opinion, right? So if your acceleration training is good, if your plyometric training is good, and uh, if your weight room menu items are, are solid and progressed at, at a good manner, um, then you can kind of get more specific with like some of your change of direction tasks. But but to me, you know, the, the big rocks of the off season, you know, projecting a, your center of mass horizontally and effective rate, projecting your center of mass vertically with short ground contacts in a congruent manner, and just making sure, you know, you, you can, you know, lift weights and, uh, and function well in the weight room. Uh, I think if you can do those three things, I, I, that covers a lot of your basis as it relates to deceleration work, right? Nice, nice. So, like when you talk about, like, again, dealing in ratios, COD deficit, like, Sometimes your cod deficit improves by just being slower in your entrance velocity, right? So it's yeah. just like that is true. That is true. <laughs> you, you, is is that the goal of sport performance? I don't know, but but it does seem like like you you want to increase them like uniformly. So is that is that the reason why Doncic is good? Uh, just because he's slow. <laughs> I I don't it, like. He's really good, man, and he can he can decelerate with the best of them. But and he's very deceptively quick in acceleration as well. So cool, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and been doing it for a long time. Like the people at Real Madrid did an unbelievable job with his like just technical development, physical preparation. Like he's been doing it for a while at a high level. Nice, nice. So, uh. I know you also work with jump, like I mentioned before. So, uh, in my opinion, like at the some athlete at the last few step of like horizontal jump or like or like high jump, they're probably gonna be a little like deceleration. So when we look, when we want to look at the penultimate step mm. or like like the last few step to go into uh the board what would you what would it be what would it be look like so it depend on the event uh long to triple are going to be a lot different you're not going to set up your penultimate as much because the projection angle is much lower in the triple jump compared to to the long jump uh for for me on the the penultimate in the long jump it is just maintenance of horizontal velocity right so if you look at in several and you should know because you're going to read the James Hay book here very <laughs> soon. But his, his studies, he's probably the pioneer of like, uh, you know, research uh, in the horizontal jump competitions. But if you look at elite level horizontal jumpers, right, they're not decelerating a lot at the board. So it's all about maintenance of horizontal velocities, right? So if you're slowing down too much in your penultimate, right, um, that's not good. So if there's too much braking forces horizontally occurring and you shoot straight up, that's not good off the board, right? Or if you don't set it up at all and just run through, also not good. So there's an optimal range, I think. And you'll read, I think it's 18 to 22 degrees of projection off the board in elite level uh, long yeah. jump. Um, but, but to me, in the penultimate step, it's just a hey, maintenance of horizontal velocity, right? If you're banging your heel in the ground and slamming, creating too much braking force is not good. If you're toe pegging that penultimate and very plantar flexed, also not good. So a nice flat foot, maintain horizontal velocities, a little bit of vertical conversion on the board. And then once you're aerial, it's just following a parabolic flight path and to, to maximize uh, aerial time, you know. Nice. One thing I noticed is like, I don't know, probably a lot of coaches can do that. Probably not a lot of coaches can do that. But one thing I noticed about you is like you kind of put science and art together because like there's science part of performance training. There's art part. There's like art of like training. How exactly do you put these two together? Um. I don't know. That's a good question. It, it's, uh, <laughs> I guess, refined over time and a lot of trial and error. So, you know, every experience that you deal with may be frustrating at the time, but you learn something new. So it's, uh, you know, I struggled uh, as a young coach, probably uh, 
probably in a lot of ways, just like being too rigid in my thought process. And, you know, I still struggle at, at times, uh, you know, even to this day where I probably tend to overthink things <laughs> and, uh, you know, probably paralysis by analysis a little bit. But having a combination of the both, I think it's just all based on like your experiences personally, you know. Cool. Cool. Okay. I'm going to go to the last part of this podcast. And this is like the reason I kind of want to ask these questions. The next part of the question is because I think because like in Taiwan, there's kind of like more and more people are into force plate. Oh, and nice. More and more people into like return to play from ACL. And I know you have you've done research about like ACL injury and uh, Achilles tendon rupture. So uh, just from, I want to ask from a return to play, a view of this is um, if we're going to do, if we get an athlete, he just come back from ACL injury or rapture his Achilles tendon, are you going to change your uh, testing protocol? Force play testing. Yeah, it depends on what stage they are in the return to performance process, right? I think um, early on the onset of Achilles tendon uh, return to play, maybe doing some like uh, low extremity isometrics would be really good. Um, and then obviously if they can't jump and land um, within the stages of return to performance, like you're probably not going to do any like jump testing, right? So it really, it really depends on where they're at, right? Um, I do think, however, in Achilles tendon ruptures and ACLs, um, it is very important to have uh, standardized repeatable tests and benchmarks that you're trying to hit um, for, for each of your athletes. But And that's why I think profiling is also important prior to injury. So you need to know what they function like before they were injured so you have some sort of context to go towards in the return to performance process, right? Um, so that's why all of these metrics are very important once injury occurs, whether it be an acute injury where they're out, you know, two weeks, um, you know, for a grade two hamstring, or if it's, uh, you know, Achilles tenant rupture and you're looking at, you know, on average, I think, uh, average, uh, duration missed due to Achilles tenant rupture in the NBA was around 10 months. So it's going to be a long, arduous, uh, return to performance process, but, there are some successful, uh, you know, case studies that we've looked at. And um, also an interesting thing I'll, I'll say moving on that uh, forward is we're, we're looking at this idea of subsequent new injury or non-specific secondary injury, right? So when we talk about some of these minor injuries in the return to performance from uh, what we consider benign injuries, uh, so uh, mild being less than a month in uh or excuse me uh moderate less than a month mild less than a week of missed time to to, to play and then obviously severe being more than a month um, when you look at mild and moderate injuries right and then you look at these severe injuries like acl tears and achilles tendon ruptures there was always a preceding injury to the acl or to the achilles tendon rupture that potentially disrupted the ecosystem of the athlete, potentially leading to that catastrophic injury. So I think when we talk about return to performance, right, it's been so well studied, you know, an ACL return to performance, right? It's been so well studied, uh, an Achilles tendon return to performance. But I think when you kind of work backwards from there, you know, uh, inversion ankle sprains occur at a very, very high rate in, in the sporting activity of basketball. Chronic knee pain and patellofemoral pain is rampant, right? I think dealing with these minor and moderate injuries and these subsequent new injuries uh, are a good way to kind of uh, utilize some of the data and utilize some of the technology to maybe mitigate the potential risk of some of these severe injuries happening. So yeah, in the ACL return to play, I think there's so many, many uh, good resources on that Achilles tendon. I mean, there's experts, it's been well studied. It's happened a lot. There's been a lot of really good uh, 
success stories within that. But I think one thing, you know, our group wants to look at moving forward is this idea of subsequent new injury or non-specific secondary injury. What was the injury before the ACL, right? What did it look like? How did it disrupt their biomechanics and ecosystem and physiology and recovery? And maybe how they loaded going into games that potentially caused the ACL, right? Now there, there's things you can account for and there's some known known factors and unknown factors that I'm sure are involved in all of these injuries, but we're kind of key, uh, you know, using a lot of the data for those two papers to look at, okay, what happened prior to them, you know, tearing their Achilles tendon or, you know, uh, tearing their ACL and what were the minor injuries that potentially led to this major injury? So to me, to me in my, my mind, like, like if we can get the small stuff right um, from these acute, supposedly benign injuries and make sure that they're functioning at, at a high level and return to performance, I think that could potentially shed light on mitigating the potential risk of some of these major injuries. Cool. So uh, before you did the webinar with, the webinar with, I think, is it called UEFA, the Europe? Oh yeah, yeah. The yeah. Euroleague coaches, yeah. Yeah. Before you did the the webinar, you showed me the PowerPoint you did with biomechanic factor involving ACL and a case tendon rupture. I personally like think that is like you asked my opinion. I personally think that is like so good. So um is that like why or how did you start like Everybody, everybody, look, everyone started with return play, started with, or oh, going back from injury. Why, yeah. how, or how did you start, like, um, with a different view of, like, these kind of injury? Yeah, so it was over just coffee with my good friend, uh, Scott Epsley, who was our medical director when I was with the Sixers. Really brilliant uh, physiotherapist, as they're called. Uh, he's, he's Australian, but essentially it's a sport – uh, PT um, and a uh, medical professional, and he does a very good job and an expert on tendons and tendinopathy and just a, a, a very good resource. But we we started going back and forth on, uh, you know, what what are the mechanisms uh, of these injuries and like, why are they occurring at such a high rate? And we just started breaking down film and breaking down film. And eventually we just found that, uh, you know, there was patterns that we saw within Achilles tendon ruptures, obviously false step mechanism or stepping behind your center of mass to project horizontally was occurring in a hundred percent of the Achilles tendon ruptures within the NBA. And then there was three different mechanisms that occurred in, in ACLs, but we just wanted to understand like what was going on. And we did a very extensive film review and uh, just kind of, um, you know, uploaded the videos into a, an analysis software and just started, you know, measuring ground contact times and joint angles and, you know, perturbations and different contacts that were occurring. So it was just a really fun project and, and a labor of love. Um, you know, we, we've been lucky enough to link up with a data scientist that scraped the uh, Internet for every injury that's ever occurred in the NBA and we've aggregated into a centralized database. So we're, we have a lot of really good uh, research coming as it relates to, I guess, functional epidemiology within basketball. I think we've only scratched the surface of the potential there, but I do think this concept of non-specific secondary injury or subsequent new injury is going to shed light on maybe some of these mild and moderate injury cases that, um, you know, could mitigate the risk of catastrophic injury. Nice. So at the beginning, when you're doing this research, do you ever, did this ever like occur in your mind that, oh, you're going to do a webinar in Europe and then got invited there? No, oh, no, no. I, we, I, I remember these, conver these conversations happened in the winter of uh, 2021. And it was uh, uh, it was right when uh, Harrison was born. So, yeah, yeah, it uh, it was a interesting time in my life. It uh, it was a project that I never thought would materialize into anything. It was just kind of a fun thing between, you know, two people over coffee. So it was it was uh, it was it was cool though. I I enjoyed it. 
Okay. So, uh, go back. This probably go back to like probably the first topic or second topic we discussed today. Um, so people are saying that uh, force plate data, force plate metrics, GPS metrics, whatever metrics, whatever test it is, it's going to dictate how athletes form it's going to dictate how well they play it's going to dictate that um, or our programming going to dictate or the data we take from it are going to dictate how how are we going to help them from like return to play yeah so like uh what are your thoughts on like these kind of like uh conversation yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think it's all important stuff. I, I really do. So, and I think it provides a layer that can provide insight to your athletes, no doubt. But uh, I don't think it's the only thing, right? I, I think an athlete, and we don't know. I, I think a lot of the the work that uh, you know Drake and Kara are doing with us. Um, it will kind of shed light on maybe some normative values as it relates to college basketball athletes and force plates. Um, but, but I, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard for me to say, to sit here and just be like, Oh, if you just hit these numbers on a counter movement jump, you're going to be really good. Or, Hey, if you hit these, uh, you know, loads during training, like you'll be really good. You know, I think it's just kind of providing context to, um, to overarching themes of performance, but it's not the actual performance. Ultimately, nice. athletes are going to make plays. And why they make plays, it may be too many generations away from a force plate test or, you know, uh, you know, metrics on a, uh, you know, accelerometry. So I, I don't know, to answer your question, maybe we'll know m more insight in a couple of years. Um, I'm sorry, I put in that hard situation to answer like these types these type of question the reason why the reason i asked these questions is because like i came from taiwan and like force plate is like kind of like the next big thing in taiwan i'm like nice. okay, okay. Awesome, man. and like people are gonna people are saying that oh force play gonna dictate everything force play gonna change everything yeah. i mean we use force play every day you use force play for years yeah so and there's uh, still there's still a lot of things like like you're gonna cut the test you there's still a lot of things you can like watch it from their training watch it with your eyes so I, i'm sorry i put it in a hard situation to answer that no yeah, i i think I think the evolution of commercialized force plates has been great for the field. So, you know, the work that Hawkins is doing and like it, as much as they've helped us out at the university, man, I, I think, you know, they do a great job, but, but, you know, it's not the only thing. <laughs> it's not going to tell you everything you need to know from a performance standpoint, but it's very important and, and valuable information for sure. Cool. So, um, like you have like multiple, like, tons of experience with high level athlete so if for those who are like interested in working with maybe d1 college basketball athlete maybe nba athletes maybe sprinters maybe jumpers what are some like suggestions for those young coaches yeah my my suggestion would be like get very good at the basics right like <laughs> basic power development right how are you on the platform acceleration basic fundamental plot metrics the these things and having context like uh, they're not going to change you know they're not going to change it, it, regardless it, if you were you know a uh, uh, high school athlete just trying to get better or if like you're an elite i mean you're still going to have to do the same you know fundamental principles regardless of where you're at now the intensity at which you do them the frequency and densities that you use to train are going to be completely different based on output based on training age based on previous entry but to, to me man just get really really solid at the basics 
And if you do that, you'll be good. And, and I, I say that because I, I'm talking to you as well, personally, like, like if you don't know James, uh, Jeffrey Dyson, James Hay, Fred Wilt, like all of the basics, right? Like if you don't know the basics, you can't talk about anything that's been written in the last five to 10 years, right? Like understand where it comes from. Jack Daniels, right? Like just read, read the original text, you know? Okay. Okay. Is Jack Daniels like whiskey? No, You're no, going to no. kill me. You're going to kill me. You're going to kill me. Yeah. Fred will run, run, run. I gave you the book. Yeah. Read it and just know the basics. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> last thing before I let you go, uh, currently you're our boss now and you're willing to let us like, you're willing to let us like take over the training or sometimes like athletes are fatigued. Sometimes maybe there's just something going on. You you are willing to let me cut this, cut the training or change the movement a little bit. And sometimes you let us lead the warm up, whatever it is. Um, as a, as a strength coach, um, can you, how, how exactly do you develop like these leadership? Yeah, I mean, I've been around like really, really solid mentors and people that were good to me over the years. So the best way I think I can pay it forward is to be good to the people around me. And uh, both from a, a peer uh, standpoint and a, a kind of a mentee mentor standpoint. So so for me, it is nothing to let you guys do that because I think you guys have earned the right to, um, you know, have that ability and do a great job for it. So I, I'm very appreciative of everything you do. And it's also, uh, I, I kid with you a lot, but I respect uh I respect you. Uh, you're always in there working very hard and you put out a lot of very uh, great content for the field. So I, I appreciate it. Nice, nice. So that's kind of like all the questions I have for you today. So for those who are interested in what we're talking about today, for those sports scientists who really want to know about the nuance of like testing the nuance of like GPS data, how can they reach out to you? Yeah, uh, just uh, through either uh, my email, it's just my name at gmail.com. Uh, that's probably the best way to do it. And I, I will get back with you. Uh, if not, they can just uh, direct message me on Instagram. I think it's just Adam Pellway. Um, either way is fine. It may be a little longer if you do that, but I, I'll get back with uh, with you if you do reach out for sure. Okay.